Hello, everybody. My guest today is Nick Francis. He's the co-founder and CEO of a company called Help Scout, where he's on a mission to make every customer service interaction a more human one. His two passions, technology and entrepreneurship, led him to start a web consultancy soon after college, where he learned how to craft user experiences with his partner. In 2010, the trio founded the company Help Scout. We're going to dive in today. Nick, are you ready to take us to the top? Let's do it. All right. Very good. So first off, super crowded space. How are you differentiating? Well, I think it's really important to approach all problems from the customer and work your way backwards. And when we learned a lot about the help desk space, the customer service space a long time ago, we found that the help desks were sort of born in the enterprise and the customer experience was really terrible. And so uh, we just wondered what it might be like if we created something with a great customer experience work our way backwards and it ended up being a really different product. And that's so that's great. where we ended up. And it's pure play SaaS business model? Yes. Yeah. Pure SaaS. That's great. Give me a general sense, average customer. What are they paying per month? Our average customer is probably seven users. So a relatively small support team. Uh, could be a, a larger overall team, but typically we're 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 working with mostly small business customers, anywhere from uh, three people all the way up to five hundred people or so. Okay, and you said an average there was seven, but but what do they actually pay for those seven seats on average? Uh, yeah, so on average, I guess that would be about one hundred forty bucks. Okay, very good. All right, so you launched now. Was twenty ten official launch year? Uh, to 2011, 2011, so seven years. Okay. That's great. Now, now you gave some context in the bio there in terms of where you guys were at. It sounds like you went through tech stars as well. Why'd you decide to do that? Well, at the time it was really, a, the, the founding team knew a lot about making products, but we had no idea how to make a SaaS business. You know, I mean, there's a, we didn't know what lifetime value was. <laughs> we didn't know what customer acquisition costs were. And so Techstars was really a process through which we were able to understand what it took to build a really successful software business aside from the product. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? That was 2011. Oh, that was when, okay. That, that, that was a catalyst that you got you guys all together. Now, did you yeah, we, we had worked on the product for about six months before Techstars, but launched it during the program. And you did the Boulder program? Uh, we actually did the Boston program. Okay, and then you said, what, we got to want to move to Boulder? Yeah, well, uh, we have a fully remote team of more than 80 people all around the world in 60 different cities. And so we spent six years in Boston, uh, but I decided to move out to Boulder with one of my other co-founders. So we're all kind of all over the place. I wanted to stretch our remote culture a bit. That's great. I like that. Now, obviously, you're an accelerator, which means it sounds like you've raised capital. How much have you raised to date? Uh, about 12 million bucks. Okay, great. And I want to come back to that in a second in terms of how you think about spending that to drive growth. So 2011 was year one. What have you scaled to now in terms of total teams using you? How many customers? Uh, about just over 9,000 uh, paying customers uh, oh, all, all over the world, 140 different countries. That's great. And where did you, so so was this the original idea in Techstars or did you guys pivot inside of Techstars into this? It was the original idea because we had experienced this problem ourselves, building products and we had tried a lot of the different products in the market. They, they didn't really work for, for at least what we wanted from, from the business. And so uh, we, we knew the problem really well. We talked to a lot of people in the space. And so we didn't really have to pivot. That's great. Now, 9,000 customers at $140 price point, you and I can both do math. That's about 1.2 million a month. Is that accurate? We'll see. I don't know. Do your math. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you tell me, I'm just taking, I'm taking two of your numbers and multiplying, right? So uh, is that, I want to make sure I get this stuff right. Is that 1.2 million? Yeah, we're in wrong? the same range. Yeah. Okay, good. That, we won't pin you down there, but generally that range yeah. is healthy. And, and what does growth look like year over year? Where were we at a year ago? Uh, so just over the last three years, we've grown at about a 60% year over year clip. And that feels right for us. That feels sustainable for us. Uh, we certainly want to operate this business as a sustainable and profitable business long term. And so uh, never, never was a desire to grow too fast, but 60% feels right. That's great. Yeah. So 60% year over year growth. If you're at 1.2 today, that means you're at about call it 900 ish about a year ago. Where is most of that growth coming from? Is it expansion revenue across the same teams or adding new logos entirely? Uh, I'd say it's about half and half. Uh, a lot of our business, uh, comes down to expansion on a month to month basis. And so that's really important to us. And what levers do you pull to drive that expansion? You know, a lot of people have usage-based metrics. Some that's feature-based. HubSpot has four or five different axes. Which axes do you use? 
believe it or not, it's kind of built into the business model. As teams grow, as support teams grow, uh, then their user count with Help Scout grows. And so it's it's really kind of a beautiful thing. Expansion happens naturally pretty much from day one. So there, there are small things that we do to try to incentivize that. But generally, we just try to, try to provide a great product and the rest takes care of itself. But you're tying specifically, though. I want to understand what you're tying to specifically. Is it number of tickets solved? Is it number of seats? Is it some other feature set? It's number of seats. It's it's purely number yeah, of seats. Yeah, we charge per user, yeah. So as a team grows, then their MRR with us grows. So let me ask you a question. If your software does like a great, great job, someone could argue, you know what, we need a smaller support team because we can do more with less, but they don't pay you more for all that extra value, right? Versus maybe tying to like support tickets answered. Why did you decide to tie to seats? So that was a tough one. Uh, there are only, when you go into a crowded space, I think you learn really quickly that there are only so many vectors that, on which you want to reinvent the wheel. And in order to be comparable to other products in the market, I think it was important. And also charging per seat is really predictable. It's it's easy for a company to say, oh, okay, I would spend $200 a month. Got it. If you did it based on something like ticket volume or something like that, it's really a guessing game. And it, it's really challenging for customers uh, to convert when there's a metric that they're not really certain of going in. Yep. A uh, churn in this kind of space, especially at this price point, is critical. What's your churn today and how do you manage that? Uh, month, month over month, it's less than 1%. And uh, we've, we've worked really hard on refining the product over the years and achieving that. So, uh, And I think it's sort of built in. If you've got a product that works really well for a support team, uh, then typically churn is going to be really low. But the other side of that is that switching costs are quite high in our market. So getting people to switch from another product to help scout usually takes quite a bit of effort. And that's less than 1% logo churn per month on a gross basis or net? Uh, so it's logo and revenue churn. We're less than 1% every yeah. month. Oh, so they're about the same. Yeah. And, and again, is that a gross number or a net number? Uh, that is a gross number. Gross number. Okay, that's great. Now, are you, uh, your team, you said it's 80 folks. Do you have an inside, this price point seems a little low to have an inside sales team at scale. Do you have an inside sales team? Uh, we do, but we only, we never did until kind of second half of last year. So Help Scout was 100% self-service business. Today, we're about 92% self-service, uh, but we are getting into some larger accounts. And so it's a very different approach that we take, uh, but we do have a small uh, sales team, four people, and we'll be eight by the end of the year. Why get into larger accounts? Well, larger is relative, right? We're still not getting into the enterprise and that's not our intention, uh, but we are moving slightly up market only because that's what our customers told us they, they, they wanted. I mean, a lot of the expansion comes from uh, what we, we deem 11 plus. Uh, that's the cohort that we kind of look at for, as being sales enabled. So 11, you mean 11 users plus or more. Yeah. Yeah, 11 users or more. Uh, typically, that's a, a more sales enabled sell. And really, it's about being helpful. In a team of 11 people or more that needs to switch their customer service offering, there's a lot of people involved in that decision. So we try to, to be really careful about that and guide them through the, the buying process and just become more helpful. At that level, self-service is tricky. Yep. You raise some capital, which means, you know, I imagine how to deploy it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have taken the dilution. What is your CAC and what do you like to optimize payback period for on these new accounts? Uh, yeah, so CAC is about 12, it depends on the channel, but it's anywhere from eight to 12 months. And we make sure to, to not really exceed that 12 month uh, barrier. That's where we try to stay below. Again, uh, we're trying to build a business that's profitable and sustainable in the long term. And so that's a really healthy uh, number for us yep. overall. So if one of these 9,000 customers is signing up for your average of about 140 bucks a month, you're saying you're willing to spend up to 12 months of that or about 1600 bucks to acquire them? Yes. Worst yeah. case. And, yeah. And above that, above that, it gets a little bit tricky for sure. Yeah. Um, how valuable to you and your internal team at strategy meetings is lifetime value? Do you use those metrics as an indicator for anything or strategic decisions? Lifetime value is really critical because everybody defines it differently. If you go with the typical like one over churn, it's far too optimistic. Yeah. Uh, so the real challenge with LTV is that with everybody defining it differently and typically more optimistically than they should, uh, then you end up with different numbers. But uh, it's a critical number for us because we want to be profitable. Yeah. So what do you assume that your lifetime value is in months? Uh, gosh. So we, we don't allow, so our formula is quite complicated, but we don't allow lifetime value to go more than three years. Although our numbers and the formula would justify that it go longer than three, we cap it 
at three just to be a little bit more conservative. Yeah, I mean, if you if you take the typical approach and do one divided by your churn rate, I mean, that gives you a hundred month LTV times your 140 bucks that, that you can start to lie to yourself pretty easily. Right, yeah, you could see how that becomes really silly really fast. Yeah, well, but you also then kind of set an arbitrage of, of three years, right? So people would argue, well, that's also arbitrary as well. well why set three years? And, and what, like, I think what's more important is how do you actually use these two numbers to drive business decisions? Well, LTV over CAC is one of the most important economic numbers that you want to look at when you're talking about how sustainable is this channel that I'm investing heavily in. So as you ramp up new growth channels, you want to keep a really close eye on LTV to CAC so that you know that you're spending your money well and that that money is going to return to you with some form of multiple in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Isn't the so, time component, though, more important? Isn't, isn't it more important to see your payback period versus LTV to CAC ratio? Especially if your uh, churn's really low. Yeah. So generally, like that's why, yes, in our case, for sure, uh, the time period we get that get that capital back is more important because the churn is low. Uh, if we did have a higher churn, then then it would probably be a bigger factor. The multiple yeah. would be. Yeah. Really interesting. Uh, when was the last round of capital you raised? Uh, it was about uh, so it was in 2015, late 2015. So we're, we're able to operate the business pretty much at break even these days. So we're just trying to take the cash that we do have and invest as aggressively as possible into growth, but at the same time make it so that we don't have to raise any more money. You mentioned you're kind of going after a little bit larger accounts. That's typically an indicator sometimes that people will raise money to facilitate the growth of the team to get the larger accounts. Are you raising right now? Uh, no, not raising any money right now and don't have any plans to. And in any acquisition talks with larger companies? Uh, not not that are interesting, no. <laughs> you like you like your the remote lifestyle? Yeah, re- really love it. And and although uh, not everyone has the same appreciation and enthusiasm for it as we do, it doesn't really matter. I think it works well for us. That's great. All right, Nick, let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Mm, Maverick. Number two. Ricardo Simler. Yeah, it's a good one. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, lots of them. Uh, I like Samir at uh, SendGrid. He's great. Yeah. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business? Trello. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Eight. That's good, Nick. And uh, what's your situation? Married, single, kids? I'm married. Any kids? For 12 years, happily. That's great. That's that's a million dollars raised for every year married. That's pretty good. That's, that's a good right. ratio, right? How, <laughs> Not a bad ratio. How many kids, Nick? Any? No kids. No kids. And how old are you? I'm 35. 35. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? How hard this was going to be. <laughs> and, and it sounds like you said you've been married for 12 years. That means you guys hooked up there at about 23 years old. She's been with you the whole way, huh? It's the a keep, whole way. It's a keeper. I, I think the key is to, to treat them like a co-founder, treat your partner that way. <laughs> if you went home tonight and said, hey, we just turned down, what, what you're doing a million two a month. Let, let's say someone offered you uh, 200 million bucks to sell the company. You have to go home and tell your wife that you said no. Does she kill you for turning that down? <laughs> she, it would, I would probably be sleeping on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> She'd get over it though, right? Right. All right. right. All right, Nick. Good stuff. Guys, again, remember, process is tough. Stick to it. Again, launched Help Scout back many years ago in 2011, jumping into Techstars. Now a team of 80 people, totally remote, serving over 9,000 help and support teams, paying on average 140 bucks a month. So about 1.2 million per month in revenue. That's up about 60% year over year, doing about 900 grand per month last July. They raised 12 million bucks. Last tranche was in 2015. They're operating now at about break even. Less than 1% logo churn per month, optimizing for about an eight to 12 month payback period on these accounts. And assuming a conservative lifetime value of about 36 months or about five grand in LTV. Again, supporting these uh, support teams. Nick, thank you so much for taking us to the top. My pleasure.